Welcome, my name is Moo. In this podcast, I'm going to be reading from a book called Five Life-Changing Ideas, written by Kenneth Tangen, Ph.D. And it's a, sh- it's a short little book, but it's, it's actually like a workbook where you do a, sort of assignments and a lot of thinking. But uh, I'm going to be reading the introduction uh, because I think it's, it's important to hear stories like this and how he came to his conclusion about ideas and about finding what ideas and um, concepts and beliefs and constructs and assumptions that we have and how it affects the way we live our lives. So this is the introduction to five life-changing ideas. I stood on the deck of the ferry considering suicide. We had left Seattle a few minutes earlier and were about halfway across Puget Sound. It was raining lightly from heavy clouds and that almost touched the water. The city's lights flickered across the black waves and I was lost in thought. Death seemed like a good solution. I would get freedom. I wouldn't have to face those questions again. I'd escape the prying looks and condescending tones of friends, relatives, and strangers. Relatives were the worst. Friends could be avoided and strangers ignored, but I couldn't get away from the relatives. Family gatherings, like the one to which I was headed, made it impossible for me to escape. I was stuck and there was little I could do to defend myself. No one understood. They didn't realize that it wasn't my fault. They blamed me for my trouble. I was unemployed and the more I searched, the less I found, but it wasn't my fault. I didn't know whose fault it was, but I was sure it wasn't mine. I hadn't made me blind. I hadn't made me an albino or given my brother Down syndrome. I wasn't to blame for my father's death. It was nature, God, the universe. Someone other than me should take the blame. Yet I blamed myself for it all. Life was out of control and I was at fault. Not for anything in particular. I was to blame for everything. I felt very alone. It was as if everything was tumbling and there was no one there to protect me. There I stood at the rail. My heart felt as cold as the steel rail I tightly grasped. I felt the words above, melodramatic. Heart as cold as the steel rail? Give me a break. Who talks like that? But when we're in the middle of trouble, we feel as if we're in a soap opera. We feel everything deeply. I felt overwhelmingly hopeless. It's how I saw life. The reality was different. I was not directionless. I had a goal I was trying to reach. I believed in my goal, was not afraid to work, and was determined to be be a success. I had reasons to be thankful. A lovely wife who was very supportive and genuinely loving. Friends who cared and relatives who were eager to help. I had talents training, and past successes. The reality of the ferry boat was different too. I felt like I was dangling by a thread, but I actually wasn't standing on the outside of the rail or hanging from the side of the ferry by my fingernails. No one had to talk me off a ledge. I was standing safely at the rail like all the other passengers. Externally, everything would have looked fine. Inside, I wanted to get away from my life. I wanted to avoid responsibility. I suffered from what I call passive suicide. Most people at some point in their lives wish they didn't have to face their situations. Like me, they didn't really want to die. They simply want bad things to end. I wanted the fates to handle it for me. It would have been so great if a gust of wind had pushed me over the side. 
I'd have slipped unnoticed over the rail and everything would be better. I wouldn't have even had to jump. Just let the wind catch me. I was hoping my life would slip away. I was in trouble. My thinking was fouled up. I wonder now how I could have been so stupid. I was suffering from irrational thinking. I hadn't thought things through. I hadn't looked at my assumptions or discovered how life has meaning for me. Ironically, what broke the spell for me was not a rational consideration of the consequences either. If I had been thinking rationally, I never would have considered suicide active or passive. No, what stopped me was another irrational thought. I looked into the deep, dark waves and realized the water was cold, really cold. Cold! I didn't want to die cold. So one irrational thought brought me to the edge of another irrational thought that saved me. Looking back, I can see now that I should have gone to counseling. I should have dealt with my self-image, my dysfunctional family, and my avoidance and def dependency issues. I didn't go for all the same reasons that other people don't go. I didn't go because I didn't know anyone in the area, though I didn't ask anyone for a recommendation. I didn't go because it would be too expensive, though most counselors have sliding fees and even without a discount, counseling is about the same price as having your transmission overhauled and much more useful. I didn't go because I was a trained counselor. It would mean admitting failure. I didn't go because it was against my upbringing. People I knew just didn't go for help. Each of these reasons turns out to be a clear indication that you should go to counseling. I didn't go to counseling and I was lucky to have survived. I eventually figured things out, but relying on luck alone is a stupid, unreasoned approach to life. Luck is not a strategy, it's an excuse. Our ideas are the most powerful things in the world. Everything starts with them. Ideas determine who we are and what we do. Programs, buildings, structures, products all begin in the form of an idea. We may not be what we eat, but we certainly are what we think. That's why I think it is so important to know what our ideas are. When trouble comes, we reason things through. We rely on our old, familiar, favorite ideas to help us out. Had I thought through my most basic assumptions before I was in trouble, I could have avoided the whole situation. I would have been thinking clearly and rationally. I would have easily discarded silly ideas and dealt with my problems. Since our thinking has such a great effect on what we do, it's important to consider which ideas are dearest to us. If we can state our most precious ideas, we can better understand ourselves. It is only by looking at our ideas that we can discard irrational beliefs and replace them with more powerful, helpful ones. The book of, is all about your discovering your ideas. Call them beliefs, concepts, constructs, principles, or assumptions. They form the basis of who you are and how you live. When you are unaware of what you feel and believe, you make yourself miserable. The more you understand yourself, the smarter you are at living. And then Dr. Tanjin goes on to describe why he chose five ideas, because it sounded good. <laughs> and um, a little bit more about how to work with the book, uh, some, some of the exercises and assignments, um, and let's see, I think he also, if you go to his website, which I'll give you at the end, he uh, says he has done, gone through all of the exercises in the book himself and jotted down notes about the entire process and he lists five of his favorite ideas. So, this book was published in 2006. It's called Five Life-Changing Ideas by Dr. Ken Tangen. It is available on Amazon. 
I believe, in Kindle version. I don't think the paperback is available anymore. Um, I got it directly from him. And by the way, a little bit about Kenneth L. Tangent, PhD. He is a speaker, a singer, a consultant, and psychology professor. He began with a voice scholarship to a major conservatory and ended up with a graduate degree in counseling and educational psychology. His website is www.kentangent.com. K E N T A N G E N.com. I hope this was helpful in some way.